All right, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to the Poetry Salon's uh, book writing event. My name is Tricia Faye Hefner. I am the founder of the Poetry Salon, and I'm really very excited to be here today. I've been looking forward to this event since we started planning it. Uh, we have some really wonderful authors who are coming to talk with us about their books and their process of writing their books, finishing their books, publishing their books, getting their books birthed into the world. And before we got started, before we get started, I just want to say a couple things. Uh, I know <laughs> we're doing this, we're being writers amidst some very interesting, um, slightly distracting world events right now. And today I was thinking about the quote from Albert Camus that any authentic creation is a gift to the world. And I feel like one of the things that we as writers can do, uh, maybe one of the things that's really our prerogative to do is to create something authentic that we get to share with each other now, um, but also that we get to leave as a record for other people who come after us. And I think the great art, the really enduring art, uh, really braids those two things, the immediate, uh, the temporal, and the eternal. So whatever you're writing about, um, if it's really got both of those things, it'll be interesting because it's of the moment of your time, but it'll also have in it a grain of the eternal. So whether somebody's reading it now or they're reading it a thousand years from now in Norway, after the aliens have taken over, uh, they're still going to find something about it that relates to them, relates to what is continuous in the human experience. So I feel like some people have been using this time um, of quarantine to dive in, to do a little bit of introspection, to work on projects that they maybe wanted to work on and didn't have time for. Uh, and some other people have been really quite busy doing other things that were much more um, immediately necessary. And I'm very grateful to those who have been keeping the world going uh, in, in the very practical way. So, you know, no judgment. Um, but I do know that for some of the people that I get to work with, and for me myself, I have really been very grateful to get to use this time for some introspection and for writing something which, you know, the the experience of getting to write has been an experience that's been a gift to me. And I hope what I write is something that is going to be uh, a gift to the future um, or even just a gift to the right now, right? So uh, what motivated this event for me was the fact that I've been um, teaching the Poetry Salon, teaching through the Poetry Salon, facilitating creative writing classes for so many people for the last almost 10 years now. And I think during the quarantine, it's been particularly necessary for us to have spaces where we can meet even remotely and talk about what's really going on. Um, and a number of folks have not only finished beautiful poems, uh, but they've been talking about putting together full collections. And I really believe that our writing is done best when in community. And I think that we all learn better and learn more when we're learning from each other. So when people started having these questions about how do you put together your book and should I publish it myself? Should I try to write for, uh, should, I, should I send my work out and try to get it published by someone else? Should, uh, should I try to wade through um, all of the forms and try to win a contest? Uh, I thought, you know, rather than me trying to answer all these questions, I want to put together a panel of writers I know who have um, who have uh, gone through it all already and can speak uh, to the experience um, in a, a way that I couldn't. So when I chose the panelist who I'm going to introduce in just a moment, um, I was looking at a couple of things. One, <laughs> I wanted to choose poets who have been part of the Poetry Salon, uh, whose work I know. I feel very grateful for some of these writers. I have been uh, one of the first audience members, one of the first editors to look at some of these works. 
Um, and two, I really wanted to choose a diversity of uh, publishing options. So I wanted to look at poets who had published not only one book, but two. I wanted to look at poets who had chosen to self-publish. I wanted to look at poets um, who had uh, gotten assistance publishing their work um, with, uh, with others. And um, of course, also what I wanted was to be able to bring writers who I care about to uh, this audience. So um, with that said, I am going to do, uh, I think I'm going to, to just give everyone a brief outline so you understand what, um, uh, what, uh, what the afternoon's gonna look like. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is that I'm going to introduce the poets. I'm going to invite them to speak for a few minutes about um, their latest book. I know for some of you, you've got so many. Uh, Alexis, I'm seeing your banner behind you. That's terrific. That's wonderful. Um, but I want to invite you to maybe focus on your most recent book. Talk about how, uh, how that book came into being. When did you know that you wanted to start collecting individual poems and put it into a book? Um, and what was that process like for you? Uh, and that's gonna be our first round robin. And then uh, next I'm going to ask everyone to talk a little bit about the publishing process, why you chose the route you went through, what was difficult, what advice can you offer us? Um, and then third, our third round, we're gonna open it up to everyone else. So uh, everyone else on the call um, can ask questions that uh, are interesting to you. And then we're gonna do a little bit of a mini workshop. Okay, so our first poet up is Alexis Roan Fancher. Uh, I can say a lot about Alexis. She's, I think, Alexis, you're one of my oldest poetry friends in Los Angeles, one of the first uh, poets I met and started talking to when I got to this crazy city. Uh, but let me give everyone your more formal bio. Alexis Roan Fancher's poem, When I Turned 14, My Mother's Sister Took Me to Lunch and Said, was chosen by Edward Hirsch for inclusion in the Best American Poetry of 2016. Her poems and flash fiction have been published in over 200 literary magazines and journals, including Rattle, Burst Daily, Vox Populi, Slipstream, Spillway, Askew, Plume, The American Journal of Poetry, The Pedestal Magazine, Petrichor, Duende, Diode, Patterson Literary Journal, Wide Awake, Poets of Los Angeles, The MacGuffin, Hobart, Aeolian Harp, The Night Heron Barks, Tinderbox, Swim, Verdad, Blast, Soflo, Pojo, and elsewhere. You can find Alexis' photographs on the cover of Witness, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Head Chapel, The Pedestal Magazine, and Heyday, as well as a five-page spread in River Sticks and elsewhere. Her street photography is published worldwide. Since 2013, Alexis has been nominated 29 times for the Pushcart Prize, one Best Short Fiction Award, one Best Micro Fiction Award, and six Best of the Net Awards. In 2018, she won the Pangolian Prize for Poetry, she and her husband live and collaborate on the bluffs of San Pedro, California, 25 miles from downtown LA. They have a spectacular view. And if you're friends with Alexis on Facebook, you can see photos of that spect spectacular view uh, in her posts from time to time. So please welcome Alexis Roan Fancher. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, a lot of nominations zero wins, okay? So, um, I know, I know, Robbie, I know. Um, did you want me to start with reading a poem from the book? Yes, please. Okay. Um, this is my, I don't know if you can really see it, maybe you can see it better over there. Right anyway, this is my new book. I don't know how to work these things. There we go. And it's uh, new and selected. Um, all right, it's, this one is called Don't Wash. And it starts with an epigraph uh, by Napoleon Bonaparte. And he says, don't wash. I'm returning in three days. 
I touch myself so I can savvy what you rut in. Bring my fingers to my mouth. Imagine you in our bed, returned from the three-day fray, redolent of the weight of the world, and me, your dirty, dirty girl, naked, eager, as you make your way down, breathing in my hair, my lips, the sweet spot where neck meets collarbone. I've made a religion of your fantasies, a science of what you desire, that ferine moan, my always startled gasp at first thrust. I angle, cocked hips a bit askew, how I arch for maximum penetration, hands pushing against your chest while my thighs pull you in. Our bed is a rocket launch, a bacchanal, a pelican steep dive into the sea. I revel in that you revel in me. A lifetime away from Michael, my first love that long ago when I'd used the freshening wipe before I arrived so as not to offend. I'd spread myself wide on his bed, confident watching the top of his head, black curls as he explored me, that fear of being not summer's eve fresh, worry my pussy might disenchant the musk of me all wiped away. He raised his head. Next time, Michael said, once he tasted me, don't wash. That's it. Um, <laughs> So um, you wanted me to talk about how my book came into being? Was that the next one? All right. Um, yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say, Alexis, I know you've got a number of them. So, um, you know, the most recent, if that helps narrow it down a bit. Yeah, that's what I thought I would, I would talk about. Um, New and Selected uh, is my sixth published book um, since 2013. So I pretty much had a book a year coming out and there were two books about um, dead children and my dead son and the other four were erotic books basically about my romp through my life with men, women and men and women and um, Anyway, I got a phone call one day from Raymond Hammond, who is the editor and publisher of New York Quarterly. And he said, I'd like to publish a book of your erotica. Published book from Enter Here, published work from How I Lost My Virginity, and new work. Would you be interested? I'm like, yeah, OK. Um, so that's how this came about. Um, I culled work from my first two erotic books and then put in a, probably a third new work. Um, took us about a year from the, from the, the beginning of the, the first conversation to the contract and having everything ready. And then with the pandemic, we waited because this could have come out in 2020 that would have been suicidal. So we waited until March of uh, 2021. And it's doing really well. I've been lucky, it had nice reviews, um, but I hustle and that's the other side of this. You know, It is very rare that some big time publisher in New York is gonna knock on your door and say, I really wanna publish you. It happens, I'm living proof, but it's, you know, you've got to hustle, you've got to get out there, you've got to know what you've got, you've got a product. And the, the poems have to go from being very personal and very precious to being a product. And there's that moment when it's no longer your baby, it's a book, it says something, it has a certain cachet. Why would they read your book as opposed to any other book? Um, 
those are all questions when you start looking at where you'd like to have this published. Who publishes books that you really admire? Who's publishing, uh, you know, Kim Adonisio? Who's publishing um, Robbie Nestor? I mean, you know, if you like someone's work, it is really a good idea to see where they've been published, who publishes them, um, and if they have contests, if they have an open reading, um, and that might be another way in order to really find out what to do, but you've got to take control of your own product. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, and if I uh, can ask a little bit more about that, push on this a little. So I think one of the things that's maybe unique for you, Alexis, is that you do sort of have your audience in mind. Um, and with the, the latest book, obviously you had the publisher before you had the book itself. Um, I think I want, one thing I'd kind of like to know is in culling these, you know, the most recent book is a bit of a unique experience because you weren't writing all new poems, uh, but were culling from other books that um, you had previously published. I'm wondering what that process was like. Was there any difficulty in finding the order in which you wanted to put the poems? Uh, can you just talk a little bit about that? Sure. What I did was I started with uh, How I Lost My Virginity and I kind of earmarked the poems that I, I liked best. It was kind of my, you know, the litmus test, do I really love this poem? Uh, and I got maybe 30 from the first book and then from Enter Here. Um, one of the things we decided to do was put all of the sister poems of which there were over 10 uh, poems I've written about me and my sister over the years. Um, we did a lot of traveling together. Uh, we shared a lot of lovers. We had a really interesting past and with her permission, I you know, read all these poems, um, but we put made the decision to take all the sister poems and put them almost chronologically, <clears throat> excuse me, in the center of the book. Um, and then I looked at my new work and I had, aside from this book, almost finished another book of all new work. So I took some from there. I took some of the things I was writing on a year later, Don't Wash came out, probably last summer. Um, so I, I took a little from here, a little from there. Um, my publisher was very involved in the order. I, I often want, I want someone whose opinion I trust to help me order the book. Um, in fact, with uh, both that one and Brazen, which is my next book coming out next year, um, I paid someone a really good editor to put them in order, to read them from beginning to end, to talk with me about any changes. And that is the best money you can spend because you get someone who you trust to look at that and go, hmm, yeah, no, mm, maybe over here, maybe move the order. Um, I think all poets do it differently, but for me, I need help. I don't pretend to have any idea how my work should be ordered, so. I'm extremely jealous. Uh, I definitely think if you can get away with it, that would definitely make um, the writing process quite a bit easier. Uh, thank you, Alexis, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, next on up, I would like to invite Chanel Brenner. Um, Chanel Brenner, also one of the original members of the Poetry Salon, used to come hang out on my couch in Culver City. Uh, so Chanel uh, Brenner is on her second book, or rather just had her second book out uh, from 53 Press. It was the winner of the 53 Press Poetry Award. And her book prior to that was Vanilla Milk, out from Silver Birch. Um, Chanel Brenner is the winner of the 2021 53 Press Award for Poetry for her book, Smile or Else. She is the author of Vanilla Milk, 
a memoir told in poems from Silver Birch Press 2014, which was a finalist for the 2016 Independent Book Awards, an honorable mention in the 2014 Eric Hoffer Awards. Her poems have appeared in Rattle, Raleigh Review, Spoon River, New Ohio Review, Muzzle Magazine, Literary Mama, Barrow Street, Salamander, and others. Her poem, Apology, won first place in the Smartish Pace Eula Rose Poetry Prize. Please welcome Chanel Brenner. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Tricia. Um, okay, the poem I'm going to read is El Dia de los Muertos. El Dia de los Muertos was Riley's favorite holiday. He loved smelling the sugar skulls, didn't mind that he couldn't eat them. My husband asks, who wants a dead kid's bike? Then places Riley's in the alley for someone to take. Some believe the dead are insulted by sorrow. My husband rummages through boxes in our garage like we are having a fire sale. He finds my dead father's rare coins in a sock and a card from my dead grandmother. In Riley's closet, I absorb the silent, airless church of his clothes and realize sugar skulls have a space on the forehead for a name. My husband runs back, runs outside to retrieve Riley's bike. All right. <laughs> so um, how this book came into fruition, um, you know, after my first book was published, Vanilla Milk, um, I didn't really plan on writing, writing and publishing another poetry book, but um, I just continued to write poems and, um, you know, about kind of about our ongoing grief and what we went through with Riley and how, how that grief affected our relationship, you know, with Desmond and just ongoing life. And um, I actually started to write memoir and was taking a workshop and trying to write longer pieces, but then poems kept on springing out of the pieces I was writing. And then um, one day on a whim, I just decided to kind of collate all of my poems that I'd written since Vanilla Milk. And I felt all of a sudden, I'm like, wow, I have enough poems for a new collection. And um, they were cohesive. And I just decided just on a whim to do it. And, you know, one thing is interesting is that um, the first poem in the collection, which is um, at a restaurant the night my son died, that one actually was a poem that was written back when probably before Vanilla Milk was published. And I kind of just set it aside because I'm like, oh, this isn't really any good. I don't really, I don't really like this one. I don't want to bother with it. And then when I pulled out all the poems for the for Smile or Else, which was originally called Raising Grief, I um, I looked at it. I'm like, wow, this poem is actually, actually, I really like it. There's something to it. So I went back and I worked on it some more and it ended up being the first poem in the collection. And also the one that I think really grabbed the attention of the editor that chose my collection. So yeah, so that was interesting. And then as far as the overall order goes, I, um, I also worked with somebody, paid an editor to actually help me with the ordering because for me, I just can't get enough, enough like space from it to like see it really, to see what kind of order to put it in. It just is really, really challenging. And I kind of drive myself a little crazy trying to order it. Um, and then even when it got to the, after it won the award, the press even reordered and we went through a whole other reordering of it. So, um, so that was kind of cool. And I actually liked the order. I was like, oh yeah, I can see why that works. It's easy to see it after somebody else moves it around for you, but to see that ahead, you know, so yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chanel. That's, um, that's fantastic and really thought provoking. Uh, so next one up on our list, if I am going correctly, if I remember how the alphabet works, I believe uh, we have Linda Neal. 
Linda Neal first wrote poems when she was in high school. She went to study literature at P Pomona College, earned a degree in linguistics and a master's degree in clinical psychology. Her life at the beach, passion for story and work as a therapist inform her award-winning poetry and prose, which has appeared in numerous journals, including California State Poetry Quarterly, Easy Reader, Lummox, On the Bus, Pacific Coast Journal, Perry Green, the Amherst Poetry Journal, Beecher's Magazine, Santa Fe Literary Review, and Slab. Dodge and Burn from Bambaz Press. Uh, Dodge and Burn is her first book from Bambaz Press. Her poetry memoir came out in 2014, and her latest book is not about dinosaurs. Um, actually, I've had poems published in, I, I was a quitter. I had a lot of poems published in the 80s and um, won some awards from Penn Women Writers and various things. And then I kind of stopped writing poetry and was trying to write a memoir and doing a lot of other stuff. Uh, so I started writing again about 10 years ago. And since then, I, I've taken myself a little more seriously and um, sent a lot of poems out and won some awards. And I'm going to read a poem from my newer collection, newest collection, Not About Dinosaurs. And I'll tell you a little bit about the birth of that after I read the poem. It's um, my, I would say my audience is, I'm interested in writing about sexuality and women and men and aging. So it's kind of a, more for um, an aging crowd, I would say. And uh, this poem was selected as a finalist for the Palette Poetry Prize. It's called The Burgeoning. There are big dicks and small, peckers and penises, cocks of all shapes called Johnsons, rods and plum tree ticklers, each one a stick, a gun, a tube that shoots. But where is the name for the tender root that finds its way inside me, like a child searching for a nipple? Where is the gentle animal word like pussy for the male member, a name like lotus or pomegranate, a flower or fruit that grows and gives a seed and pushes its gentle head into the core of me. What could we call this stem that through the skin fuse drives me to meet the infinite, that joins with me in the plant realm of flower and tree? There must be a name for the malleable bud that grows between us and joins us together in the ritual of coming and coming. Could we call it redwood? No, that's too impenetrable, too tall, too hard for the sweet rumpus and buzz of the supple plant that sings its way into me on a night when the light filters in from the hallway and the bed's rumpled field of wet white lilies. Uh, I have a whole raft of poems, some of which I was pleased with and some of which I wasn't pleased with. And I started sorting them when I was in, um, and I was in a master's program at Pacific U and I was working on my thesis. And I finally, after I, uh, with, mainly with Frank Gaspar. And when I finished the program, I decided or actually it was bef before I finished, I realized that a lot of the older poems were not gonna go into my thesis. I had a, a different book in mind. And I took some of the poems out of the thesis I was writing, added them to the ones I already had. And then Frank helped me, he helped me with the first ordering. And then the second ordering came when I decided I'm not gonna start sending this out to contests and I just wanna get it published. I'm getting old and I need to get stuff out there. So that's when I decided that this book, I had a lot of poems that reference dinosaurs. So I kind of came up with this idea of this book about extinction and about the gutsiness and dirtiness of life. And I, I had worked with Bambaz Press in the past on my first book. So I contacted them and said, I think I've got another book. Let's go to it. I like them a lot um, because they, they call themselves publishers for hire. 
they're not really a vanity press because they're fairly selective and they um, give you exactly what you pay for. There's no secrets, no mysteries, no add-ons. And they do some editing. They, um, Bambi is really wonderful at helping order the poems. She's, that's one of her strengths. And Baz is a good creative director who formats. They, they take you, if you were gonna self-publish, you'd have to do all this stuff yourself. You pay them a fee, they do it all. They get the ISBN number. So it's almost like having a publisher. Um, uh, they do not, however, uh, do distribution or work on uh, publicity, but they will sort of help you with the publicity some. So I've been very happy working with them. And um, the book came out last, gosh, last fall. Yeah. And so that's where we are at this point. Thank you, Linda. Can everyone hear me now? Yeah. Now. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Uh, thank you, Linda. That's fantastic. Um, next on up is Tanya Ko Hong. Tanya is the author of four poetry collections, most recently, The War Still Within, Poems of the Korean Diaspora from Kaiso Flash Press 2019, written primarily in English. Before that, she published Mother to Myself from Prun Sang Sang Press 2015 in Korean, Yellow Flower on a Rainy Day, Oma Books of the Pacific 2003 in English, and Generation 1.5, A Sprit Books 1993 in Korean with English translations. Her poetry appears in Rattle, Beloit Poetry Journal, Entropy, Cultural Weekly, WSQ, Women's Studies Quarterly, published by the Feminist Press, uh, the Chosen, Ilbo, The Korean Times, and the Aeolian Harp Series Anthology, among others. Tanya Ko Hong, welcome. Good to see you again. Hi. <laughs> um, so um, I think it's very interesting. But what's interesting is I feel like even though I live in America and I publish in, um, in you know, English, but then it's just like another part of me um, in another world. Because let me just read a poem first and then we go. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to read, start with Korean a little bit. And then this is like a kind of really fun because people remember like what I'm doing it right now. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna read in Korean and then you could think about whatever goes in your mind. You could go daydreaming or have a fantasy, I don't know, but like just go and do it and then you let me know later. Sokkoritang, 죽음이란 어떤 느낌일까? 나는 왼쪽 손등 위에 상처를 바라본다. 건보라, 이걸 무엇라 하지? 멍, 고통을 누르는 것, 슬픔에 침묵하는 것, 바다 위에 재로 뿌려져 겹겹이 쌓여지는 양피지에 새겨진 삶들처럼 단풍잎들처럼. 전에 나는 이곳에 있었던가, 나는 이곳에 다시 올 것인가. 모양을 인도에 남겨놓고 바람 속으로 사라져가는 지붕 위에서 전화 코드를 빼라고 말하는 까마귀처럼 가스를 켜고 나는 오야코 돈브리를 만든다. 양파를 썰며 흘리는 눈물. 이건 최고의 선물이 아닌가. 차가운 계란을 깨고 거품을 풀어 배추와 닭고기가 펄펄 끓는 국물 속으로 돕는다. 냄비 구덩을 열고 가스를 끄고 기다린다. 흐트러진 빈 침대, 여름강이 흐르는 귀의 찬몸을 보고 싶지 않았다. 난 떠날 때 아름답게 떠나고 싶다. 결별, 한 시인의 시가 생각난다. 아내의 장례식이 끝난 뒤 베갯잎에 붙여있는 그녀의 머리카락을 보고 울어버렸다는. 부더 울었을까? 내가 떠난 뒤. 아버지가 돌아가신 날 나는 스키악기를 만들었다. 
아이들을 먹여야 했기에 소꼬리탕 아버지가 만들어 주셨던 그 죽은 핏물을 다뺀뒤 우유빛 날 때까지 끓이는 So keep it in your thought whatever you have just write down on the piece of paper whatever don't lose it right and this is how it goes oxtail soup who knew that was oxtail soup <laughs> i i look at the monk on my left hand the bruise dark purple holding in the pain silence of the shadow ashes spread on the ocean setting in layers palisade of lives like maple leaves how does death feel impression left on the sidewalk after they've been blown away a raven on the roof that said disconnect the phone i'm turn on the gas to make oyako donburi tears come while cutting up the onions isn't that the best gift I crack cold eggs, whip, and pour them over, boiling napa and chicken broth. Close the pot lid, turn off the gas, wait. Was I here before? Will I come back here again? Pour over bowl of rice, feed child. Empty a made bed. A summer river where I didn't want to see his body. Separation. One poet said, after his wife's funeral, he found a strand of her hair on the pillow and wept. I made a skiaki the day my dad died. I had to feed my children. Oxtail soup. That's what daddy made. Suck out all the dead blood and boil until broth turns milky. When I leave, I want to leave beautifully. So um, that's the poem, the oxtail soup. And then this is like my latest book, um, The World's Street Within. And I didn't put the, um, the bio yet, but like this book, A Word, um, the 10th Go Once Found Memorial Foundation, 2020. And then I just had a award ceremony in LA, um, March, April. And uh, this book cover, it is for sexual slavery during World War II. So this is a comfort woman. And I think, Book cover is very important to choose. And then I wanted to shout out Alex from, um, the, because she um, actually helped to choose this picture, the cover with my publisher. And then I also have to say that actually Alex is like that. I think we met like a 2013, 14, 15. I'm not sure, but I was publishing the rattle and then I had invited the um, reading at the rattle. And then that's, I was reading the rattle poem published in there in Korean and English. And after the reading, Alex came to me, Tanya, can I have your ad, um, the email and then I want to send me the poem. So that's how I connect with Alexis. And then after that, she was helping me to get with the editor that who is excellent to go over to the my poems and select it. Actually, she became my publisher. And so I think how, what I wanted to try to say is that it is hard. It is hard to go and then bold yourself and then, you know, read. You know, sometimes you feel like, oh, you got to be a future. Yes, but, you know, open mic is really good too, to go. You don't know who's going to be there to reach you out. 
And I just had reading in this, I'm in New York right now, but like I was reading at the, I was a feature in Oceanside and I was reading just like, you know, reading one poem in Korean and then I was reading other poems. And then after reading, someone came to me say, did you read the oxtail soup? I wasn't reading oxtail soup, but she remembered on the Zoom that I did the same thing, like I was reading the oxtail soup. So um, it is very important to be hustled. It's a tiring, it's a really tiring. And then you're like in your own, your own island. It just like, it feels like sometimes like you're talking to yourself on the wall, but then just like invitation, like, you know, Tricia said, like, you know, come, can you read it? And then even though you feel, you don't feel like it, it is very important to go read it. And um, I'm just keep saying about the Alexis, but because she's the one who's really actually pushing me out to the world. She goes like, Tanya, you have to share. If you don't share, that's a disgrace to like what you have. It is important to share it. And then I think for my situation is, is like really kind of unique situation because I really don't know who's my audience could be because um, I start writing in Korean very, very early age, but like I'm living in America. So, but my um, writing, my art is just different than first generation who's like writing just only in Korean, even though they live in here like 30, 40 years, they're still in living in, you know, Korean community and just writing in Korean. And then I'm not second generation. So like, I am just like kind of merge, you know, having gap in myself, myself, seriously. Even that poem that I just read to you, I wrote in English first, but then to translate in Korean, it took me another, many, many months is just like to write it, to even understand myself. So um, the process of like publishing poetry book was really, really hard. It wasn't easy. I've been publishing here, there, and um, awesome. And then I had my MFA in um, Antioch University and I've been publishing like rattle, you know, blowy, you know, I mean, everywhere else, but like putting in the contest, I become a finalist, but like not publishing. But back to the analysis, and then she goes, Tanya, let's look at your poem again, and then let's submit it. That's how I found like my editor and publisher. And so that was really good. And then I just have to tell you another part is that this book is Purun Sasang, that published in 2015, even though I keep writing in both Korean and English, and then Korean professor said like, your poem is very unique. And then he found the publisher in Korea. And this is a published in 2015 in Korea, but um, you don't live in Korea. So you don't really like get to know your name in Korean, but like I have to share and shout out the triumph on this book after seven years later published Korean translation um, in Korea. They picked 25 books to read and uh, write essay. And if you write essay, reading after my book, you could win even $2,000. They are giving away $17,500 away to for book essay. But um, I didn't even notify that I got picked it, but like, I'm just so happy to share it. So even though seven years later, your book is recognized. So I know you may feel frustrated, but when someone say, go hustle, like Alexis say, go hustle, Tanya, share your work. Then you have to just put your feet and then take your back and then you go share. And here we are. Thank you. Is that? <laughs> Yay. Uh, Tanya, thank you. And I, I wanna say thank you too for giving some voice to a few things. Um, you know, I think we all kind of have heard that thing that we write for ourselves. And I think that's true. And I think, you know, even if we were on a deserted island, 
we most of us would probably still write because we do it for ourselves. Uh, I've been fond of saying I write for myself. I edit and publish for other people. Mm -hmm. And um, I love that it's you were writing for yourself and it took a push from someone else to say, you now go out and get it out into the world. Because I think for so many of us, we have some variation on that story. Uh, at the Poetry Salon, I like to say that we're, we're kind of like a dream catcher for poems because lots of people will write things and say like, well, I wrote it, now I'm gonna just throw it in the trash because I don't think it's very good. But the rest of us who are a little more objective can say, no, no, I can tell you that's much better than you think it is. Please finish it, send it out. Other people are gonna wanna hear this. So um, just thank you for giving voice to that because I think that's uh, a big part of why we all do this, why having community is so important. So thank you. I, I just wanted to share the one thing is like the community is just so important. Without community, it is just, um, because sometimes just like even like we pay for somebody to edit your like order of the book, that's important. You know why? Because sometimes you're in your own world. You don't know what you're doing. And I just have to share this. Um, we're in the Jack Grapes uh, workshop, Tricia. And mm -hmm. um, I have to share that. That's, we're at the bathroom. And then that was the first time that I met. And then I said to Tricia, Hey, Beloey wants to publish my Comfort Women, but it is not a whole poem. Like this is a six, you know, excerpt. And then it was just like a two excerpt they wanted to publish. And you know what Trisha said? Heck yes! <laughs> Say yes! <laughs> Say yes! No. Oh my God, I never forget that. So the community, you don't know what you wanted to do, but like just shared it. And then again, I didn't know the Kyle Press. I didn't know the editor. But Alex is there, like, I think she will be really carefully looking at your work so Absolutely. that you don't know. So like, it's just connection. We're a family. You need to help <laughs> each other. seriously, right? Thank you. Yes, yeah. thank you very much, Tanya. Um, many, there have been many places where I have been saving people from, uh, destroying their poems and, and encouraging them. I show up in people's dreams and say, don't throw away that poem, send it to Beloit's or wherever I think it belongs. So, um, and it's a great poem. I've read it there and it's it's wonderful. Uh, so thank you, Tanya Ko Hong. Next on up, dividing the time between California and Texas, uh, please welcome Kamari Carter Hawkins. Kamari is the author of Death by Home, a stellar body of poetry that seeks to normalize neutral hair and find solid ground in an ever-changing world, and write back to you a guided journal for writing yourself back into your life. Kamari leads journaling workshops all across Los Angeles and beyond. She holds a master's degree in organizational management and is a poetry fellow of the Community Literature Initiative Poetry Writing Program. She is a proud advisor of the CLI and World Stage Press. Kamari is affectionately known as the book doula because she loves to help writers develop and publish their books. She is the founder of Mama's Kitchen Press, an anthology press that seeks to publish intimate moments and stories that tug at the heart. Other poetic works can also be found in Rise, an anthology of power and unity by Vagabond Press, and the Best of the Poetry Salon 2013 to 2018 Anthology. Kamari is the 2018 Spoken Word Voices Heard Women's Amateur Slam winner and performs her work nationally. She lives in Los Angeles. Well, she lived in Los Angeles. Now she's dividing her time uh, with dozens of guitars and hundreds of her books. Please welcome Kamari Carter Hawkins. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Trisha, again for having me. I'm gonna start with um, this, my book, Death by Calm. Oh wait, I should unblur myself. One second, please. Okay, there we go, I'm unblurred. Uh, Death by Calm, and I'm going to share, I guess, the title track, which is called Death by Calm. I calm, rake, groom, scrape, 
separate, tease, and untangle more than my hair. The peculiarities of my personality, odd infatuations with detangling the sound of my voice. I want to use this bristled tool to run and slice its way through this evergreen forest, shrubbery need, I'm sorry, shrubbery of this need for others to tell me what to think. I want to calm to take pieces of, I want this calm to take pieces of me I repulse with the rest of the shedding. Let the worry, teary regrets, and the unforgiven be gathered in the rake, fisted, then tossed alongside old Q-tips and dirty towels. I want to fine tune myself until all kinks and knots have been mercilessly snatched out until there's nothing left of me. Okay, so Death by Calm, the inception of it, it's, uh, it's kind of, it teeters along a lot of uh, very sad topics for me because at the time I wrote this, I believe I was 25 or so. And at that time I was diagnosed with Graves' disease, which is a thyroid disease. And that was, for like in your 20s, you're invincible, can no nothing can harm you. But what happens when it does? And I was told, you know, you could die, you cannot have kids and all this stuff. And uh, it was crazy. And so Death Back Home, I feel like is me, it's like how we talked about tonight, writing poems about yourself. I think it was about myself and the journey. I was going through a lot of questioning, questioning of, of God, of love, of health, of my future. So it is a, I, I, dare I say coming of age, I'm not sure, but like coming of life, coming, <laughs> the side, you know, that those are the themes that are within Death by Calm. And I wrote this during the program Community Literature Initiative, which is mm -hmm. a publishing program for poets. Uh, and it was founded by Hiram Sims. And, I, and this was, they're on their eighth year of doing this. And I was a part of year two. So I'm excited that they're still doing this. And so if you're interested in that, definitely. But it's a great program where it's 10 months. And, and for me, it was, it's critiquing every when, every month, well, depending on what the day it was, it was Mondays for me, but every week you could, they critique your poems. And then at the end of the 10 month program, they gather local independent presses and the participating students can pitch their books for a chance at being published. And I was picked up by World Stage Press, which is based out of Lamert Park, Los Angeles. And I'm really excited. So that was the, that's the Genesis story of Death by Comb. And um, anything else I want to share about that? I will say something I feel like one thing that I'm learning about poetry, it's hard to like look back, like for any of you that have multiple like um, books of poetry, like looking back, it, it it tugs at my heart a little bit because I'm like, oh, like I shared that or oh, like I was really going through something or oh, I'm not, I've, I've, I've grown past this, but I've, you know, skillfully. And what I have to say to that is, I think that that is why you keep writing and keep publishing books to build like a discography, so to speak, where you have like this track of your growth. And so I look forward to, um, I, I'm, I'm working on a chat book now that's almost done. But one thing that I, I self-published was this journal that was mentioned. And I think we'll talk about that on the round two. But this was a journal that I did self-publish. And it is it has writing prompts in it. And it was great. So I have experience of being published by an independent press and then also self-publishing a work. So that's all that I have to share, unless there's anything else, Tricia, that I'm missing. Oh, one more thing because I know Tanya shared about the book cover. I just want to share this. My book was modeled after Vintage Hughes's book uh, by Langston Hughes. So that's why I chose this cover. And then Sandra uh, Cisneros put out a book as well. So if you want to do something like this, <laughs> you can. That's lovely. <laughs> much love there. Thank you very much, Kamari. Uh, next on up, welcome to the stage, my friend and yours, Kelly Hanwright. Kelly Hanwright is a writer of poetry and fiction. 
although more successful in the former than the latter, she says. She has been writing since the age of eight. As a child, she made up stories and sometimes illustrated them. Once she sent them to an aunt who surprised her parents by responding with a thousand dollar check to be put into a college fund. Boot, boot. Raised by parents with untreated mental illness, Kelly lives with anxiety and complex PTSD. She seeks to empower other women to give voice to their trauma through writing as part of the healing process and to erase the stigma and open honest dialogue about mental health struggles. And her book is The Locust Years. Please welcome Kelly Hanwright. Thanks everyone. Um, this is my book, The Locust Years. This cover, um, it was so interesting, Tanya talking about how important the cover is. So many people have commented on this cover and how much they love it and that it's intriguing and other things. Actually, I had a friend, Michelle Young, she's an artist as well as a writer. She's in the Chattanooga Writers Guild with us. Kate, um, down there on your screen, and John Manoni are in it with me too. Um, but she wanted to create a cover for me. So this is actually a painting that she did. She contacted me and we collaborated on what the cover might look like and this is what she painted. And so it's a, a painting, which is pretty awesome. So the poem that I selected is Wild Card. Mama's rants are endless javelin sharp insults, demonic daughter, despised by God, filled with Satan. Each phrase lands a blade in my chest. Unseen blood from reopening wounds pours. This day, new idea forms out of exhaustion. The kitchen drawer, the answer is there. I hold the knife over my wrist. I swear, make this stop. Stark stare replaces words. Silenced tormentor turns, swallows nameless bitterness, disappears into darkening house. So that, um, my book, thank you is basically collected out of my healing journey. Um, my mother had untreated schizophrenia. And what it was, she was terrified of seeing any doctors for it or getting any help. She had a, her diagnosis was in the 50s. So, you know, they were still hazy on everything, including what types of help they could give you anyway. And short side note, my father had PTSD, like the kind you get from war. So one of his relatives had him committed to some place and they gave him shock treatments because they didn't, I guess, know what to do with him. So it kind of screwed him up more and that made her fears even worse. Um, and so when I, after my mom passed away, um, I had been caring for her. So because again she was terrified of everything so it's not like you can put her in a nursing home or anything she had a lot of health issues but she wanted to stay at home so i cared for her and after she died i put myself in therapy um and began to unravel all this stuff um, she i know it sounds odd but when you're raised in an environment whatever you're raised with that's the world for you so mm. It never occurred to me as a child growing up, really, until I got into my teens, I started to question some things like, okay, that's odd that she says that or whatever. But it never occurred to me that people weren't trying to follow us home, that my dad wasn't possessed, that um, all these things, like there weren't demons living in our house. So it was, it was pretty terrifying. Um, but then when I got into therapy, my therapist was like, listen, I had schizophrenia. And that was a complete shock. And because of all the stigma on mental health issues 
and mental illness. It was it was a hard hit for me to accept that. Um, and so then I found out that I had complex PTSD, which is different from the kind you get from it's from trauma, and, um, particularly childhood trauma. You can get it from living with a mentally ill person is one way that that can happen. So um, it's like this toxic mix of depression, anxiety, flashbacks, things like that. Um, Tricia's question was, what was the genesis of your book? Basically, it just started as trying to get the words out about all this new stuff that I had learned about myself and my upbringing and my family that I had never considered. So the only way that things would come out, I forget who also said this, um, poems just kept coming. Oh, it was, you know, uh, I was also trying to write, write about it factually and it just wouldn't come out. But I found that times when, I don't know, metaphors would come to me or something and I could put it in poetic form and get it out that way and I just needed some type of outlet. So poetry became my outlet and I just started working through my feelings about everything that way. And then trying to decide how to put it together, um, I just had conversations with different people. I got the idea vaguely um, when I read Mar Margarita Ingen. Two Cultures, Two Wings, Enchanted Air, that's it. I knew I was only saying half the title. Enchanted Air, Two Cultures, Two Wings. It's a more about growing up in Cuba. I'm sorry, growing up in Cuba. She was born in Cuba, and then she they immigrated. And um, right after that, the Cold War happened. So she was able to see her family, most of them. And that's what that's about. But it, it just dawned on me, hey, you know, you can put together a memoir this way. And then um, a couple years ago, I was in a Chattanooga Writers Guild workshop with Dana Shaman, the author of The Body Tourist, about her struggle with um, eating disorder. And she was encouraging me to try to find a way to put my story into a memoir. I had several, several conversations with John Minoni, who on here. Um, and we started talking about storyline. And I started trying to put it together, I guess, after some of our conversations, but it was so hard I almost because I had a lot of times, um, I would have flashbacks trying to put this together and reread everything and trying to edit it. Trying to edit it was like, for a while, it was almost impossible. I had to thank God for critique groups and editors because it was like I would start and like cry so much I couldn't see and have to put it away for a while. Um, but eventually, like, one of the things I went through was kind of a crisis of faith, and um, the poem, Irreversibly Blessed, in part two of the book, covers some of that, but um, I just, you know, if everything was fake in my life, if everything was my mother's imagination, then how could faith be real, how could God be having plans for my life and all this. So um, I eventually worked my way through that and I would I pray on the way to work in the mornings. I was praying I don't know about what, but um, God began to kind of nudge me about really putting this into a book. Um, I felt that it was something that was important to share because 
by opening up about my own struggles and showing everything that had happened, it kind of redeems, I guess, some of that stigma and some of, it just gives a positive turn to everything that happened and also can help others have the courage to share mental health struggles. Mental health is health. Y'all have heard that. That's becoming like a champion slogan for um, mental health activism. So the book is a way for me to be a mental health activist and support others and in solidarity about um, the importance of being a community and letting supporting each other in our mental health journeys instead of um, like isolating people basically as so often so then um i started making an earnest cry i made a decision to do this and i got some friends to beta read for me and make they made in-depth comments about three or four friends of course I read it. leanna singata sarah lee kale sass and then I met Tricia in a workshop, Nancy Lene Wu and Rising Night workshop. Some several of us have been in together uh, right at the start of the pandemic. And I had just started looking for a serious editor to kind of tighten everything up, a content editor. And someone that I knew, some acquaintance, put me onto this editor. And the first thing I want to say to you is. <laughs> Um, the editor is super important, and right behind that, make sure the editor believes in your work, because if they don't, they're not going to do you one ounce of good. And if they're not listening to you, if they don't think your work is important, then find another editor by any means. <laughs> so I put a query out, maybe in the group, I don't even remember, and Trisha answered me and said, I'm an editor, and I'm like, well, great, because I'm a tool. And then, um, long story short, she just really believed in the work and wanted to edit it and work with me on it, so she did. And I took her rewriting class with the Poetry Salon and Arthur Kazakian, and after that poem that I read at the beginning, Wildcard got rewritten and reimagined in that workshop the rewriting workshop let's see i'll show you there i really like the way that it turned out thank you so much kelly that's that's really wonderful so for those who chose to self-publish um or you know skip the process of going out and finding a publisher who could either say yay or nay to your work uh, i'm wondering what led you to that decision um, did you feel like uh, there was a reason you chose to self-publish as opposed to going the more traditional route? Um, well, I chose to um, self-publish because I just, I am a rebel and I didn't want to be told what to do. So I got to put it on Amazon myself the way I wanted to and put charge whatever I wanted for it. When you self-publish, you can control your own metadata if you buy a uh, your own ISBN from Bowker, so that's what I did. Um, I just wanted it to be mine, and I wanted to offer it for a not, what I considered, not exorbitant price, and everybody's like, you're not charging enough, and I'm like, I don't care, I get to make that decision. <laughs> I, I just love that on its own. I'm a rebel. I want total control and you get to have it when you self-publish. It's kind of, uh, it's a great way to um, engage in some rebellion there. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, anyone else want to speak to what it means to self-publish and why you chose that route? I know I chose self-publishing for um, for the journal because of the, the speed of it in terms of I didn't have to like typically publishers have, you know, they have a whole catalog and you may not get published for like a year or two, depending on what they have going on. And then with the genre as well, but 
I know for sure with the book um, that I've helped with others, um, self-publishing and the one I'm going to do, I think I'm just choosing so because I want, I want to build up my own catalog a little bit faster and uh, practice a little bit, practice with my work, get better, improve, and just like share that journey. And then eventually like, yeah, of course I want to continue to be published with an actual press. But I think for me, what it means is uh, just a little bit more speed. And then I think you get to just practice out loud and build your own, build your own catalog. Yeah, thank you for giving voice to that, Kamari. Um, and of course, I will make a plug here for you and say that you have not only self-published your own book, but you found your own press, Mama's Kitchen Publishers. Uh, so, you know, that's that's a little bit something else um, to bolster your prestige, let's say. Um, so thank you for that. And of course, yes, see. Uh, I'm getting some good questions here. I, I am going to turn to them in just a moment. But for those of you who chose to go the other route, uh, I would love to know, um, especially in contrast, what was that like uh, to be searching for a publisher? And, uh, you know, did you ever, I guess, at any point consider self-publishing? So that one is more for Alexis, for Chanel. Okay, um, I'll respond. <sighs> for me, I, I, I understand there's some really lovely things about self-publishing, which um, Kelly and Kamari uh, covered very, very well. But for me, I wanted to be taken seriously. And I found that for what I was building in terms of my oeuvre, it made more sense to go that way rather than publishing it myself. Um, I got really lucky. I, I found publishers pretty much right away. You know, my first book was very erotic and very in your face. and. Everyone said, who would want to publish something like that? And I contacted a publisher here in LA and a publisher in um, Oxford, England. And I got two contracts in the mail. You know, this just doesn't happen. Um, my book, uh, Junkie Wife, I sent it out 20 times before someone um, Eric Morago at uh, Moontide Press picked it up and said, I want to publish this. Um, you never know. You really never know. But to me, publishing with a quote unquote real press, it, it just made more sense. It made me feel like I was building an oeuvre with a press. Um, also, if you get a good press, they will help you. They will, uh, New York Quarterly is sending my book out to all kinds of contests for me. Um, they send it out for reviews. Uh, they, they have the budget to send me 50 copies and say, let me know if you need more and go ahead and sell those. Um, it's very helpful to have a bigger machine behind you. But that said, even with the biggest presses now, you're pretty much on your own. You know, they don't have even Norton and big presses like that. They don't have the money, they don't have, they can't do that much for you. So yeah, I'm New York Quarterly, big, you know, wadi da but they're only helping me a certain amount. And I have made all my readings. I've, I've uh, sent out the book for, for review. Um, you need to partner, whether it's with yourself, like Kelly, and, uh, or, you know, you need to partner with the press and the press when they see that you're willing to put yourself out there, you know, you're willing to have readings, you're willing to, to do the work, they will partner with you. But in the end, it's, um, it's up to you. Um, I did want to go back over one thing that we were talking about, which is the importance of a cover. Mm -hmm. uh, those, I never know which way this is going, but those are the covers. <laughs> The six books that are out there, I have designed and created every one of them. The photos are mine. Um, 
I get that written in my contracts because I want to control how it looks. I want to control the vibe. My background is in advertising, predominantly print and um, radio advertising. And I know how you, you want somebody to pick up the book. You want them to look at it and go, I want to read that. It's got to have a really good title. It's got to have a really good cover. And if you don't, why not? Because that's, that's your first line of defense. You're in a bookstore and there's four books that are up on a, on a counter. Which one do you pick up? When you go in a bookstore, ask yourself that question. What do you gravitate toward? What do you turn off by? You know, and imagine your audience and give them something that they want to pick up. Uh, Alexis, that is wonderful, and that's also a bit of a segue into another question I noticed here, um, it, which is, what about titles? Uh, and um, if it's okay, I want to actually volley the ball over to Chanel here, um, because I know specifically you had some with your first book, um, you did some work with your editor about titles, and I think you have some hopefully useful things to say about that. So, yeah, the title, um, you know, actually with, um, with the, my most recent book, Smile or Else, um, the working title or the title I was sending it out to for a long time was Raising Grief. And um, which I was, which is the title of one of the poems in the book. And near the end, or I don't know, maybe like a year and a half in, I started to think about that I didn't know if I wanted grief in the title and if it was turning some people off and, you know, so then I changed it to smile or else. And ultimately the press, you know, loved the title and kept it. But I, you know, I know that presses will change, completely change the title and, you know, you don't, you shouldn't be wedded to your title, you know? Um, and then you were referring to my first book. Yeah, Vanilla Mill. Yeah, and that was originally called um, The Christmas Boy. I can't. Even, I actually can't even remember the whole title, but it was The Christmas Boy. And I think it was The Christmas Boy Will Not Disappear. That's, um, that's, that's yeah, it. That was yeah. a, I haven't yeah. thought about it in so long. Good job, Trisha. <laughs> you remember the <laughs> well, title. I remember because I happen to really love that title, and I think this is where we should always be mindful that everything is subjective and there is no right or wrong way because I remember hearing that the publishers wanted to change the title to the vanilla milk um and I was like no the Christmas boy cannot will not disappear that's such a more beautiful interesting and you know poignant title so I had my you know I had my own little mm -hmm. teeth uh mashing yeah. into that uh so I mean that's definitely why it's it stuck with me but um, but they had different thoughts and I'm just wondering, uh, you know, did they give you a particular reason why they thought that vanilla milk would be a better title? Yeah, they actually thought the Christmas, the religious acts aspect of it. Oh, Christmas, okay. That it had a religious, you know, angle or people might think it's a book about, I guess, Christmas or the, you know religion. Oh, okay. I don't know. That was their reasoning behind it. Um, and ultimately vanilla milk felt right to me. And that's the title of one of the poems. And it was, it meant a lot to, you know, Riley, it was like one of his favorite things. So I was okay with switching it to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that, you know, that's great. You're right. Because otherwise it is, it does feel too seasonal. It does feel like you're only going to pigeonhole a certain target audience and maybe push some others away. So um, I guess they were right. Okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, but thank you for that. Um, Chanel, while we're still on you, I also wanted to ask you a little bit uh, about the experience of um, continuing to submit to contests because I think um, well, I know the story and I think the story is a good one. So would you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I sent my, I'm like, I have the list right in front of me. And I sent it out. This is like my little lame list, but I sent it out to 60, 61 places. And over two years, took a lot of patience. Um, 
and I got discouraged and had to like, you know, stop myself. I did. I think what kept me going was the, um, I got made it to one finalist list with um, Black Lawrence Press and then a semi-finalist with the Wordworks. Um, and so I felt like, I think that made me feel like, okay, I've read or I heard somewhere that like, if you make it to a final, you know, finalist list, you should be patient. You might, you know, you might win. So I decided just to stay with it. And a funny thing is I was just looking over kind of the numbers. And the funny thing is that I had 53 rejections before I got accepted at press 53 and won the contest. So I thought that was pretty funny, (laughs) like crazy, Uh, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah, that is that is really terrific. Um, <laughs> incredible synchronicity. I uh, know. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Um, I kind of want to. Yeah, I was just going to say. I know Linda and Tanya. I haven't heard from you, so if either of you have something you want to share, please, um, please feel free to jump in here. Yeah, I mean, um, Chanel, I remember like, you know, you're writing a poem with me at the, um, she's just like in a living room, like many, many years ago. Mm-hmm. I and I that. cannot believe, I cannot believe you had like all that, like, you know, submission. I mean, that is, <laughs> I wanted to just really like applaud for that because Thank you. Thank you. I'm serious because it's like that we don't have that uh, patience with ourselves. Don't you think like, I mean, Mm -hmm. submission is like a writing poem is hard enough. And then submitting is just another totally another word. Yes. And I think actually when Alexis has the um, submission um, service, so like actually I submitted myself to different places and then I don't know, but sometimes that um, helping because she knows the where to submit which poems. So remember that like I had the service with you that like you're submitting the poems for me and you wouldn't believe like I've been like publishing like this because she knows where they need, they want to hear my poems. And then that was just like amazing. And because I think everybody knows what their strength and then not strength. I think for me, I don't have like that much patience for like a submitting and then finding resource. Sometimes it's really, really hard because you have to work, you know, where to submit, which magazines, and then like you have to like, you know, the Chanel has like all the list out, like I don't even know where I started it. So that is very important to be organized. And that's why I think sometimes it's like a self-publish would be right way to go. But the other hand is, even though you self-publish, you have to really promote yourself and you gotta be out there, you gotta be hustle. But I think I choose um, and then I'm thankful that I have a publisher, but as we all know that like poetry publishing and small press, they don't have a budget. And then even like my publisher upfront, Tanya, this is such an important book. Are you sure you want me to publish your book? Because I'm not gonna have a press kit. I'm not gonna um, have like, you know, have a reading because she's the small press. I don't have all this energy. And so she was very upfront telling me, this is what I can do. I'll, I'll, I'll make you a beautiful book, but I don't have anything to do with press kit, you know, sending out, sending out like, you know, like, you know, just a book review, but like she has a limitation. So I had, more I could have the trust within her that she's telling me the upfront, this is what I can do if you still want to go with me. And then I agree with her. The reason is that she's giving her heart and soul to publishing at, like this book. And then I, can, I cannot do by myself like this. I, if I do self-publish, I cannot make this beautiful font. And then like she carefully look over 
send it to me, proofread, we're back and forth. And then it just feels like I have partner who's really giving so much love and energy into my book. And then she gives all the attention in this book. You know, when she's working my book, that's all she gives. And then I love the care. And then I said, I can make my reading. It's no problem, but pandemic, right? <laughs> pandemic hit. And um, I still, I think like I'm still going out and making my reading and stuff. But um, for me, um, that my publisher made it this beautiful book, self-published, I think I wouldn't ever to do it. And then putting Amazon, you know, like all that kind of stuff. I don't think I have that stress. Maybe um, next year, maybe I'll have a strength, but I am very pleased to have publisher and then who really have insight and love my book. Do you know what I mean? That's so, wonderful, Tanya. Yes, yeah. thank you for that. Um, and that's that's a great story for your publisher to be a friend about yes. that. It shows that they really care about the work. And I want to say something work. similar that yes, I Linda, thank you. That I didn't talk about enough earlier, really. Um, the idea of self-publishing kind of overwhelmed me. Um, and working with Bambaz Press was much like what Tanya describes. They give you very good attention. They edit, they, they work with you, and they take your work because they're, they like it. They don't just mm -hmm. publish. That's why it's not really a vanity press. They don't just publish everybody that comes, that's out there. And they, they work with people. And um, I felt really seen and heard. And, uh, the, the, and I chose to do it with them because I'm older. And I thought, I don't want to mess around with contests for my first book or two. Now I'm ready to do that now that I've published some, a lot of poems and gotten some recognition. And now I'm ready to say, okay, I'm going to go hunt for somebody who, who has um, more cachet, maybe would be the word for it, to hunt for a, a, what you call a legitimate publisher and see if I can win a contest or something. I may not, but I didn't want to do that um, for my first book and even my second one. So I just want to give a shout out to working with a, a publisher who honors you and um, yeah. honors your work. Absolutely. And this I think is, um, I want to open this up for everyone, but I want to start uh, with Linda. This is a question that several people had that put in the chat. Um, and I think it's really, uh, it applies to all of us, whether you're self-published or, um, you know, published through a, a different press um, or, uh, you know, wh whatever way you're going about publication. Um, how do you go about marketing? And I know that could probably be you know, a three hour class on its own. So maybe just some bullet points about what, what everyone wants to say on that. Um, and Linda, I did just want to start uh, with you because um, I wanted to ask specifically about Kirkus reviews. You know, part of what we talk about here a little bit is about the legitimacy of self-publishing uh, versus, um, you know, for lack of a better word, the legitimate presses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I think Kirkus review is something that you know, correct me if I'm wrong, lends a little bit more yeah. um, objective authority. I thought about doing that, but I also had good um, recommendations from some well-known poets that I felt having them uh, honor my book or write a blurb for it um, or a, an award from Writer's Digest and places like that, those kinds of things were also good um, recommendations to get my book out there. I noticed that the bio you have is very old. I sent you a newer one <laughs> that had more good stuff in it. <laughs> but um, I, uh, when I sent my picture, I think I sent a newer one. Anyway, it, it's, it's, 
the other part for me as kind of an introvert is that it's, um, I really, I really hear what Alexa says about how much you have to promote your own work. You have to be out there. And I'm probably not as good at that as I'd like to be. Um, I do do some open readings. I do, um, I do get involved in some different uh, poetry scenes, but probably not as much as um, would serve me better. So those are things that I think uh, are really important to look at when you self-publish. How much can you actually, or publish with a publisher like Bambi and Baz, which is essentially self-publishing. They do all the legwork for the book, getting the book out, but then it's up to me to then promote it. And um, I sometimes feel like uh, I wish I had a little more of an extrovert's hat <coughs> to do that better. So, uh, and I really appreciate it when people come and ask me to do things. And like when Alexis featured me in Cultural Weekly, um, because, and that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been out there doing a reading, I'm sure. So those kinds of things come to you by your own hard work. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so I, again, I'm kind of opening this up and this will be the last, question and then I want to uh, have a little time for some writing for everyone who's here. Uh, so yes, who would like to say a little something they've learned about uh, self-promotion, either from working with the press or working on your own? I will. Oh, go uh, ahead. Okay. Um, Make a list of all the, the literary magazines that you love, um, that, that publish the kind of work that you like, that you'd like to see them publish you. Um, do the same thing in, in, in terms of venues. We're here in LA, you know, now that we're opening back up again, you've got stories, you've got Beyond Baroque, you've got the bookstore downtown, the last bookstore, you've got, um, you know, make a list. Where would you like to read? Um, my most recent book came out March, beginning of March. Uh, right after that, I got a hold of uh, Ben Trigg and Steve Ramirez at Ugly Mug and said back in, in March, hey, I, I loved reading there before. Do you want me back? And in August, they're going to have me back because they've been closed this whole time. But he kept yeah. my, my email and I was patient. Um, you got to know what you want. You got to be able to ask. You got to be able to be told no and not take it personally. It's not your first child or even your fur baby. It's a fucking mm -hmm. poem. It's a fucking book. If no one ever looks at it, no one will die. It's important to you. So get out there and promote the fuck out of it and show people who you are. I'm, I'm doing a, a reading next week and I'm going to say to them, and the, my first live reading, I'm going to say, buy my book. You know, come up afterwards, take the book, pay me the money and I'll sign it for you because poets need to eat. Mm -hmm. Poets need to have feedback. Um, yeah, just just get out there and do the work. Um, nobody's going to come and knock on your door in the closet, in the bedroom where you write your precious poems and say, I've been hearing all about you. I want to publish you and send you on a world tour. You get what you put into it. I'll say something. I mean, I wrote it in a chat, but I know this is being recorded. So for those that yeah. um, don't have access to the chat, um, so I'll talk about, I really love what you know, Alexis said. Yeah, you definitely have to be brave and put yourself out there. I think sometimes we, I think it's, it's easy to neglect the networking across, like the, the grassroots people, the people you are writing with. So I think that like, yeah, of course it'd be great to perform at, what is a bookstore downtown? I can't think of it right off the top, but just like Last all these store. Things, the last, the book last store. bookstore, you know, you want to do all these things. But what happens to just like a little coffee shop and you have three friends and they bring their friends 
and you're reading poems and like creating there's power in creating your own opportunity mm -hmm. i guess that happens from you know if you're being and i think that's why self-publishing exists because like you're creating your own opportunity you can create your own tour perform everywhere you can if there's virtual like now is the best time there's virtual open mics everywhere show up be everywhere you can but at balance you know help you know you have to rest and take care of yourself but really does require balance i mean it requires hustling i also think it requires like you know social media skills i, I don't want to like not neglect i don't want to neglect that because it, it is powerful it's a powerful tool and sometimes it is, it is sucking it can be very like catty at times but if you can balance your mental health i really think that social media is a great tool but it's not just posting like here's a random flower that I saw on my walk. No, like every time you post something, especially promoting a book, not that it's like buy my book, buy my book, but it's a poem or it's like a tip or, you know, you're about yourself behind the scenes. So it's really learning about marketing yourself in a very creative and valuable way. Uh, I do social media. So like, that's kind of one of my, it's not a passion, but I do it for work. So I know a little bit about it, but I think, there i just want to hone in on just like the social media aspect but also the power in networking across like maybe you don't have ten thousand followers but your friends have 500 and you have 100 like let's all come together so that's just one thing i want to say about the yeah putting yourself out there just be everywhere you can <laughs> mm, nice and and also kamari i think you point something out for those who are worried about being introverts versus extroverts and do you want to go spend all your time in coffee shops late at night personally I'm an extrovert but I like to be in after the sun goes down so that's always been a bit of a challenge for me you also have access to social media marketing you can be the most introvert person in the world my sister's an introvert and um, that's what she does for a living now is uh, marketing online and so you don't always have to have the desire to go out and be physically in front of 500 people. Uh, you can be online and be in front of 5,000 people while still in your pajamas. So just do keep that in mind. Um, to share um, something. Yes, Tanya, because yes. I think it is um, you show up for yourself but another important thing is show up for your friends. When Alex is reading, you show up for her reading to support. Then yes. it is because um, I think we are like a community and we all know this is a lonely job. And it is hard enough to write and publish and say like, this is my book, you know, that's hard enough. But when you have your friend's face in the reading that you feel supported, you feel loved. So you really, really need to show up for your friend's reading. I really think that's very, very important. I really, really think that that's uh, so important. We have to show up for other people. And that's how you make your new friend as well too. And then also you don't know, like you might get the gig there too as well in another class. And um, in here in New York right now, I happen to have like a two reading and one is in Connecticut and the other one was Oceanside. I didn't even know. I have to go take a train. That was the first, you know, the Connecticut that I have to take a train hour away and then get an Uber to go, whatever. But anyways, and then I didn't know anybody, but I did go and then I did a feature and reading. And after that, the you know the person that who was a feature another person and then she messaged me hey you know i have like this reading would you be future so like you don't know so you go up for yourself but like you show up for other your friends i think that's highly recommended because we are family yes. after all yes thank you so much for saying that and at this point um uh I could I could sit here chatting with all of you, my poetry family, forever, but we've already gone almost half an hour over. Oh. Not totally unexpected. It happens. Uh, I hope I hope worthwhile. Um, I do want to move us into a little writing portion here. 
Uh, and um, I do want to also just invite everyone to take a look at what's going on in the chat, too. Uh, it's so funny, Tanya, just as you were saying that, Robbie was saying the exact same thing in the chat. You know, one of the big things we do is we become good literary citizens. We show up for each other. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that's just about, you know, um, a quid pro quo. It's like, you know, why do we do this work? We don't do this work just to get our names out there and become famous. You know, you get out there because uh, we're social creatures. Even those of us who are introverts are still social creatures and we want to talk with other people about the things that matter to us. And we want to talk with other people who have lived different lives so we can learn more and uh, broaden our horizons and grow as people. Um, and for me, you know, I, I have this kind of rule, I guess, about when I submit individual poems to uh, journals and things, mainly you can get a lot of journals online for free. Um, I read those journals first, and maybe not every single journal all the way through, uh, but if a journal picks up my poem, I read that journal. I read who I'm published with in that journal, and, uh, you know, social media makes it so easy. I'll often find that person on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, and then I follow them. And I've made some really great literary friends throughout the years. And, um, you know, I think that's really the reason you, you want to do this. You want to have literary friends who care about writing the way you do, who can uh, be your moral, artistic, emotional um, support and teachers and community. And, you know, the publishing is just a way of extending that to a larger audience. Uh, and it's, it's quite amazing because even, you know, right now we're, some of us coming from Costa Rica, some of us are uh, in New England, some of us are in Tennessee, some of us, a lot of us are in California, and yet we can communicate in ways we never would if we didn't write and publish and put ourselves out. Yeah. Um, so with that said, um, I, uh, I do want to kind of transition us uh, out of the panel and into a little writing exercise. And even if you don't consider yourself a writer, even if you're not totally sure you're um, ready to put out a book, I want to invite you to stay here and uh, just write and share. And during the writing, you can get up, you can stretch, you can take a bio break, you can have dinner, or whatever it is to take care of yourself. Mm. But before we do that, I just want to give a little silent applause, spirit fingers to all our panelists. Uh, thank you so much for being here. If you can stay, I would love to have you um, doing a little more writing today. Uh, and if you can't be here, I totally understand and just say thank you again for being here and sharing your wisdom. Um, and there will be a follow-up email where I send everyone links to all of the uh, books that the panelists um, uh, mm. have published, their most recent ones and their previous ones as well. So. Um, with that said, oh, I just want to invite everyone to do a little shoulder roll. A little stretching there, just get us out. So we've heard some really lovely poems and we've talked quite a bit about um, the writing process. So I think it might be fun to do a little writing of our own. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the questions that some people come up with in the workshop, we have an incredible workshop, by the way, and if you want to find out more about it, uh, we put the link in the chat, uh, but we have a writing group that meets pretty much every day at 9 a.m. California time, and it's facilitated by me, um, but it's also facilitated by some of our guest poets, like Robbie Nestor, like Kelly Hanwright, among others. And, um, and we write, we share, and we give each other artistic support. Uh, and you can get that and get access to that for as little as $34 a month. So that's basically a dollar per writing session. And you'll learn from some award-winning poets. Uh, and you can also get feedback on your own work. And we also have a book class for those who really um, are ready for a book uh, in which we um, work on building the spine of your book and putting it together. I'm sure you'll all notice that no one here uh, on our panel today said they did it alone. We all have editors and thank God because it makes life easier speaking from personal experience. Um, but 
But one of the questions that some people uh, ask in the poetry workshop is, uh, you know, <laughs> does anyone want to read my writing? Right? And I'm sure we've all asked that. I'm sure even our panelists have asked that. Uh, I have some writing of my own that I like to do for myself, but um, do, do, does anyone else want to read it? Should I go through the trouble of putting together a book um, and sharing it with others and going through all that work? Uh, is, it, is it a boost to others? So I actually have a writing exercise that I think is kind of helpful for getting a sense of um, what your book might mean to another person. And uh, it's a little strange because like I said, I think the first step of writing, you are doing it for yourself um, to do a little self-reflection. And I often invite people to write what I think is the worst draft. And oddly enough, when you say write the worst draft of a poem, it doesn't necessarily produce bad writing, but the point of saying that is to get people out of their heads. Don't judge what other people are thinking, right? But then after that, after you've taken that step, um, it is useful, I think, to say, okay, how could this be useful to other people? How is this not just me doing some self-reflection, but how can I make this or how can I find what is universal here? Uh, so a really interesting exercise I like to think of um, that helps me solidify or, or you know, re reframe, refocus my own thinking around writing is, uh, I want to invite you to think about someone who might benefit from your advice. And that could be as familiar to you, as close to you as saying, uh, me 10 years ago. Oh, if only I had a time machine and could go back and talk to myself 10 years ago, what would I say? So you might think about writing to yourself 10 years ago. It might be someone else, it might be a younger sibling. It might be your own kids, nieces, nephews, uh, whoever it is, I want to invite you to kind of get that person in mind. Maybe it's a group of them. Younger version of me, my nieces, anyone coming out of college right now, we all probably need kind of similar advice. Might be a person departed and you just want to talk to them. So get that person or those groups of people in mind. And I wanted to invite you to make uh, a few notes. We're not writing a poem, but maybe a list of things that this person um, struggles with. Not the advice you would give them, but a list of things this person is struggling with and some objects that represent that struggle. So, you know, since I keep going in and out, uh, I'd like to invite someone to read this first poem. Um, Kelly Hanwright, would you please read the tasting? Sure. I just had it pulled up and now it's gone. Okay. The tasting by Elia Braden. Outside my window, the grapes are laboring on the vine, hoarding sun and water until skin taut with exaltation, they sigh into the pluck and crush their end and their beginning. They don't regret the rocky soil, the spider mite, the morning chill, nor do I as I taste the peach and pear oak and velvet of the chardonnay i'd no more kick a jagged stone from the path that led me to this place than spit this nectar from my mouth lovely thank you um and kamari could i get you to read boat body sure boat body by kelly grace thomas there is not enough distance between us and the body. I beg the women, build an ocean, turn on tongue and territory, bargain, 
spark and fire, tease flames into family, taunt each island into telling these stories still birthed in our bellies. A century apologizes for someone else's hands. I cradle my grandmother, ghosted into guilt. Can't forgive this landscape. I will not kneel for a man's affection. Women, keep this world bloom dizzy. Teach these teeth to tender. We are swollen with tomorrow. It's time to holy one another instead. Salt water saints crowned in sea foam, the blue of each majesty. They can't sink us if we name ourselves sea. All right. So I've got a few other poems here, which you can read on your own. Uh, this prompt is in the file, but I want to give everyone some time to actually write. So here is the prompt and I'll leave it up. Consider writing a poem of advice or explanation about what has happened. What advice have you learned? What advice would you give to a younger version of yourself or to somebody you know? And in some way use objects from your lists in whatever way you want, okay? We'll go for about 20 minutes Somebody asked about the soundtrack we were listening to. I think it just went into YouTube and put in piano music calm or calming piano music. And I also put the link to that in the chat. So if you want more calming piano music to write to, uh, you can find it there. So with that said, I know that uh, we only have about 18 minutes left. And I've turned off my, uh, my video because um, the internet is just a little wonky and I wanna make sure you can hear me and I don't uh, keep futzing out. So uh, I just wanna say a couple more things. I know we won't have time for everyone to share, but fortunately once a month, we host a poetry reading with an open mic. Uh, this is another one of our free events. So if you don't get a chance to share today or you just want to wait and um, edit your poem before you read it out loud, then I would invite you to come back next week, same bat time, same bat channel, two o'clock California time using this same link and you can read your poem at our open mic. Uh, we will also be featuring the poet Janine Hall Gailey, who is one of my favorite authors. Uh, she's the author of I think seven books now and her latest one is um, out from Moon City Press and uh, oh shoot, <laughs> the title of it just flew right out of my mind. Um, but I think her first book was called Becoming the Villainess, which I think will give you an insight into her work. She is just amazing. I highly recommend coming to hear her speak. And she will also be doing a workshop for us uh, two weeks today, from today, the last Sunday of the month. And if you're a Poetry Salon member, you get a 20% discount on tuition for that class. So um, lots to look forward to. And with that said, I want to open it up. I think we've got enough time for maybe four or five people to share. Sharing, definitely not mandatory, but highly encouraged. So please let me know. Yeah. All right, well, with that said, everyone, I just wanna say again, thank you all for being here. Um, you know, we offer these uh, free events, uh, usually about once a month. On the third Sunday of every month, we do our um, uh, 
poetry with a featured reader and an open mic. And of course we have some other events that are paid for events, uh, but really we just want to make sure that our community, our poetry community is growing and is healthy and that everyone gets a chance to get some inspiration. Um, it is wonderful if you can come to write with us on a regular basis. We try to make it as affordable as possible. Uh, if you are interested in joining the Poetry Salon, as I said, it's about a dollar a class, $34 a month, uh, gets you access to our generative writing classes. And um, you can also get access to our editing classes and our build the book class for a little more than that. And if you want to just come for a daily event uh, on Sunday afternoons, we, we have the a la carte option. So our next one will be next week. That's free. That's the open mic. And the following week, uh, we have a wonderful class with Janine Hall Gailey, one of my favorite poets, who will be teaching us about speculative poetry writing. Uh, if you want to just try it out for a day, I highly recommend coming to that. And um, and if you have any questions, uh, please send me an email, Tricia at the Poetry Salon. I believe we have uh, the email of everyone here. And if you um, would like to get a follow-up email, uh, we will be sending one out with all the information on where you can buy books from our panelists, what's coming up next, the link to our uh, open mic, which happens a week from today. Uh, just about all the news fit to print and all the poetry that you can stand. So, <laughs> so with that said, um, please uh, reach out, Facebook, Twitter, social media, whatever other social media platforms I didn't mention. Um, and my email is always open as well. And uh, once again, thank you all for being here. I hope to see you again soon.